troubles in one part of the world can and do have a spillover effect on other parts of the world these days so do. it's a, it's a, it's a volatile situation but i think on terror i think the world will have to unite much more strongly much more strongly you can have differences there can be territorial disputes right. but you cannot have a situation where you say i or somebody funded by me mm -hmm. or somebody inspired by me mm -hmm. can use terror to achieve to uh, achieve objectives. political objectives right. now you can if you have a military conflict you are in military conflict sure. is a different thing mm. but you will be in trouble for two reasons that then you are unraveling the very foundations of civil of the civilized world hello and welcome to strat news global Israel and Hamas conflict is of course making headlines for the past 3 weeks but what really is the position of the global community on terrorism is something that we haven't discussed enough on at least on our channel and i thought uh, mr hardeep puri who was of course uh, india's petroleum and urban housing and urban development minister uh, is uh, someone who has dealt with uh the terrorism part the counter terrorism part of it in the un in his previous avatar as the minister uh, the foreign service officer for india and and the un uh, representative uh, their permanent representative in the un and i thought today i'll talk to him about uh, that aspect of uh, international relations and global politics uh, rather than petroleum or or urban housing so thank you very much for your time minister uh, puri and uh, let me straight away come to this uh, question in your previous uh, avatar and uh, in your previous specialization you've dealt with the issue of terrorism as also uh, the un uh, rep india's permanent representative to the un what is the counter terrorism committee and what is the issue of the uh, resolution uh, 1373 no first of all the issue of terror has been around for a long time exactly what is terror terror is an instrument that you use in order to strike terror or to achieve objectives which your organized military strength may not be able to do that has been the uh, thinking behind uh, people who resort to using terror as an instrument right uh terror has been used as an instrument by small groups of people by organized groups of people and in some cases by a state also sure that is when you refer to state terrorism right i had the uh, i would say uh, in some respects uh, the privilege but also uh, it was quite an experience of being of coming face to face with issues relating to terrorism when i was relatively young foreign service officer i was posted in um, colombo i was only a first secretary i would having put in about 9 10 years of service 10 11 years of service and uh, the sri lankan ethnic crisis had an ethnic dimension but clearly had issues of uh, uh terrorism which it the sri lankan state had to confront and clearly there was an indian dimension to it of because course. they sought sanctuary in uh, uh parts of uh, south india there's a large tamil population in india and elsewhere from which the uh, sri lankan um, uh, militant groups or terrorist groups um, depending on what language you want to use right. uh which draw drew strength you could go on arguing about the extent to which the state was involved or the government was involved yes. there are things which can be said in so a uh, large population in india felt that the tamils had been reduced to second class citizens right and uh, they had the benefit of english education uh, in sri lanka or in ceylon as it was called earlier by virtue of the fact that they had the benefit of english education they had a passport to jobs uh they were only a minority community and that re led to resentment etc well it is one thing to deal with those um, issues relating to minority rights through a political or a constitutional process it's quite another if somebody takes up arms yeah so when the ltt uh, uh, was formed and it gained strength uh we were invited to be become the peacemakers um uh, i uh, was the first secretary dealing with political work i made contacts with the uh, uh, militant groups in jaffna uh, with the with their representatives etc and i was ultimately the person 
designated to fly out Velupile Prabhakaran, the LTT leader, from his um, uh, uh, hideout in, um, in Jaffna to, to India. And then he came for a meeting with uh, the Prime Minister and the India-Sri Lanka peace agreement, which was a very um, uh, valiant attempt to forge peace right. in a country divided by ethnic exactly. But, you know, two or three things haven't changed. Uh, I, I remember you as the points person, actually, between uh, the LTT and the government. That well, I was to the extent that the concerned agencies uh, had uh, maybe, let's say, a level of mistrust and developed between them and so on. I mean, uh, but I was then the official, uh, I was the face, yes. the, the, the uh, political officer dealing with them. Right. Look, no organized state anywhere in the world, democratically elected or otherwise, is going to allow terror to be used as an instrument of policy. No one will allow it, no matter what. For, and any, the, political, for and any political objective. For any, and the jurisprudence on that, if I may use the word, is very clear. Absolutely. No act of terror can be justified just because you say, I have a good cause. You can use violence in a calibrated way against military ragging. But by terror, if you target innocent uh, women and children, as was done on 7th October, there is no justification. Now, the apologists for uh, the other side will say, no, but you know, they are in occupation of a territory. That's all not acceptable. If that were to happen, and you can, somebody, somebody gets up and says, well, it, you can have a 9-11, you can have a 26-11, you can have a 7th October, will now enter the lexicon. You will have a situation where anybody can gets up with a few resources, you can just, you know, introduce mayhem into a society. True. So, I, so that is the conventional and that is the dominant wisdom. We attempted a comprehensive, uh, 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 you know... Counter-terrorism? No, comprehensive, uh, you know, a convention on uh, terrorism in the UN. Right. It ran aground because they said one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Right. Again, I think that's a very, very misplaced debate. Mm. The 1373 committee, which you... Right. You see, the, what happened, uh, Nitin, is that Unless you have to face what terrorism is, you don't know what it is. We were always at the receiving end of cross-border terrorism, exactly. coming from you know where. Yes. But the West, for the first time, faced it at its own doorstep. Suddenly they grew up, and this is a very serious matter. You must, under the Security Council, set up a 1373 committee. And they thought it was so important that for the initial years, the chairmanship of the committee was only held by the P5. Right. And then, of course, along came India, and we were elected to the committee. You were there in 2011 uh, and 12. Yeah, I 11. chaired the committee in 2011 and 12, 12 yes. uh, when we were on the Security Council. Right. After me, another one of our colleagues uh, chaired it for half the time. Right. Okay. Now, I have two submissions to make to you. When there is a terrorist outfit, countries will proscribe it or they will say that um, it's uh, banned, etc. Hamas is um, banned by a large number of countries uh, in the West, etc. The UN has other systems also. They have uh, a 1267 committee, which is the Al Qaeda yes. and um, the other group, Allied group, Allied, uh, sanctioning committee. Right. But what has happened just now is that the world, at least so we thought, there was an element of restraint that acts of terror would be committed by people very carefully, calibrated, designed to those things because there are differences and they will do it. But this one was in a class apart. Sure. It was designed to invite maximum response. Yeah. Because the game that they are playing is that there will be a disproportionate response. That disproportionate response will lead to a number of things. And then half the world or most of the world they thought will be pitted against Israel. Right. It's a totally wrong calculation. Mm. Because whilst you may be in favor of a cause X or a or a, or a or a group Y. Nobody is going to accept that the entire foundations of a free world are going to be destroyed like this. Exactly. What does a terrorist do? Mm. A terrorist takes away the most fundamental right of all, the right to life. life yeah. And I would like to believe that uh, certainly the world has become a much more dangerous place. It is. But this is just the beginning mm. of a churning that will have to take place. Especially in that part of the world. That but in other parts of the world. Because there are a lot of people who are holding on to strongly held views 
who will say that no, um, you know, this is right, that is wrong, and I am right, you are wrong. But the point is that is not how you are going to conduct yourself. Yeah. And you risk the dangers of a much bigger conflagration, conflagration, exacerbating the violence, drawing other players into it. Whether it will happen or not will depend on the uh, wisdom and maturity of the people involved. I am always an optimist and I think people will be able to see what the downside is. Right. Because if you, you've got so much of uh, weaponry there and you've got, um, you know... Funding also. Funding also there. You also have, uh, you know, a fairly, a little more loose uh, non-proliferation um, structure around. And I, I believe that uh, this could spiral out of control. I don't think it will. Right. I mean, affecting the supply lines on energy is only a small part of it. But the very existential is, you know, the existential question. I mean, if you look at the history of the First World War and Second World War. So, I think, uh, I personally believe that the uh, uh, Hamas outfit is bitten off more than they can chew. Uh, earlier, other groups were taking advantage of this. Um, when I was accredited to the court of St. James, I used to tell my friends in the UK. MCO, that look, um, I don't see you are seeing the emerging pattern. He said, no, we are an open society right. and people come here. I said, they take advantage of your democratic yes. uh, society, mm -hmm. the freedoms that you offer. Right. But at the end of the day, if you have to maintain the structure of your society and its uh, uh, you know, stability yeah. and integrity, you will have to be careful. I think a lot of people are suddenly realizing that they've gone too far. Right. And uh, troubles in one part of the world can and do have a spillover effect on other parts of the world. These days, so it's a, it's, a, it's a volatile situation. But I think on terror, I think the world will have to unite much more strongly. Much more strongly, you can have differences, there can be territorial disputes. Right. But you cannot have a situation where you say, I or somebody funded by me, mm -hmm. or somebody inspired by me, mm -hmm. can use terror to achieve, to uh, achieve objective. political objectives. Right. Now you can, if you have a military conflict, you are in military conflict, sure. it's a different thing. Mm. But you will be in trouble for two reasons that then you are unraveling the very foundations of civil of the civilized world. Absolutely. How civilized I, it is, <laughs> you and I can argue about. No. But this is happening all the more because the multilateral system which was established after 1945, mm. that is in disarray. So I was going to come to that because since you worked in the UN so extensively and at the highest levels, what is the UN's uh, role now? Can it uh, intervene effectively or it's now just a bystander? No, first of all, what is the UN? Yeah. Let's be, again, let's get our definition right. There are three UNs out there, as I know. <laughs> One is a UN which is um, a, a, a combination of the 193 member states. Right. Then there is a UN out there which is a secretariat funded by the member states but uh, sometimes does things on its own. Right. And the third UN out there is the... Um, civil society and NGOs, etc., which in many ways is a very powerful one. But collectively, the so-called UN is in disarray also. Sure. Why? Mm. UN had primarily, I mean, I put everything aside, two functions. One is peace and security, sure. and the other is uh, develop. develop. And you can say human rights and so right. on. On the peace and security part, you have a paralyzed Security Council. It's been paralyzed since the, uh, the time we were on the council, 2011 and 12. Correct. It has been paralyzed because permanent members of the Security Council, the five of them, are in disagreement. Correct. As they are on the uh, Middle East uh, uh, issues today. Yeah. As they were on the Russia-Ukraine thing. Mm. So what is happening? The one agency which is designated with the authority to make a determination mm -hmm. on whether there exists a threat to peace and security, the Security Council. Right. And if it makes the determination that there is a threat, it is the only agency which can authorize mm. the use of force or all means necessary. Sure. Now tell me, you see all these conflicts around the world, yeah. which of them went to the Security Council to seek um, uh, 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 approval? No. They don't bother. No, no. So if you can wage war without um, bothering about the Security Council, right. and the Security Council can't do anything about it, that speaks volumes about uh, what kind of effectiveness the multilateral um, uh, system post-45 anchored in the UN has. Yeah. And I'm afraid, uh, unless you are able to correct that, it will. Things... You know, somebody, a wise man said, you know, you don't construct new structures mm -hmm. till there's a crisis. Absolutely. The UN itself was born out of a crisis. Right. There was a second world war. It was still going on right. when people got together. Right. 
to look at the post war structure and to see what can be done exactly so well, let's wait uh, whether that restructuring will happen or not but just one question before we move on to your core uh, areas of uh, responsibility now um, india's stand uh, has been very calibrated india's uh, looking at it in a very um, comprehensive way i think the world will realize that uh, what india is doing is the right uh, absolutely mm. no no there is a there is a certain clarity there is a uh, absolutely uh, uh, you know uh, a policy clarity which is anchored in the real world i mean the pm statements at the time of the russia ukraine war bear this out correct the pm statement on the uh, israeli um, hamas. Uh, hamas issue on after the 7th october are absolutely clear and they are being cited all over the world right i mean i mean the g20 declaration uh, talks about the um uh, uh, pm said this is a time uh, for not peace for not for war mm. equally i mean no one and i i'm surprised how some people fudged it no one can doubt what the pm said ki look this is a naked terror attack exactly. and which doesn't change your view on the need for no. a two nation exactly. uh, a two nation solution. Yeah. solution because there can be no other solution right but you see the hamas's philosophy is that we want to see israel obliterated it cannot and and, and mm. that is as absurd yeah. as saying that the whole palestinians can be obliterated sure. so i mean you can be against hamas but you can't be against the palestinian no. people equally no. No. so a lot of super intelligent people are now doing that but you know those are people who have not been part of the government or have not had the uh, uh, responsibility to run a government Right. today you are in a very interesting uh, phase phase mm. i think uh, as wiser councils prevail there will be people who will say that uh, a state must be held to a higher level of responsibility than a non state actor right. non state actor being uh, the hamas the hamas or anyone mm. and then human rights debate was also peculiar when i was ambassador to the un i met the leader of a, the british delegation then mm. and she said you know uh, non state actors don't commit um, uh human rights violation i said where have you got this from right. that is traditional uh, political philosophy taught in uh, british university mm. that the state is all powerful mm. and the state by virtue of being all powerful is repressive it uh, you know commits atrocities no it commits atrocities against uh, helpless individuals or non state actors right. but you know they forgot mm. that that helpless individual ultimately became a non state actor right. and the non state actor became uh, which group do you want me to name i mean uh, al shabab it became uh, al qaeda al qaeda and uh, and it had a pan uh, it had a global reach with global financing but they realized that only when the west got attacked exactly. i'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad no, thing no. but you know i don't i can't feel the pain from a reading a book right it till i till i'm affected by it i see what the damage it does to my exactly. social fabric killing our innocent people right now that now nobody cites that no. that human rights violations are only committed by the state i mean some uh, nut nut case professors and universities they might i mean be. the kind of uh, atrocities which are being committed yes. and violations of all of human rights exactly the terrorist takes away the most fundamental right no. right to life yeah. so that is the change in thinking that you can see so in a way india is really you know leading that uh, middle path and, and and the just path if i may say absolutely so absolutely that is there but let me move away from that and come to I, you just came back from mozambique and uh, if i uh, read the uh, details correctly this the uh, india is doing one of the largest uh, investments abroad we have we have a large investment mm -hmm. we have a 9 billion dollar investment mm -hmm. in a gas facility in LNG. in cabo de Gal delgado mm -hmm. and uh, three of our companies mm -hmm. have uh, put in i think a total of 9 billion dollars mm -hmm. and uh, there was uh, a, a security problem there right uh, and as a result of which the operator total energies of france mm -hmm. had to invoke a force majeure right now that force majeure i think is going to be lifted shortly mm -hmm. then about i said 35 36 months after that mm -hmm. we should see gas production it's a very big field it's uh, the gas there has uh, less impurity than most of the other gases in terms of carbon dioxide and i think um, if all goes well and this pr pr facility starts producing gas in the next 3 years or so which is what we are expecting all the mm -hmm. contracts have been awarded etc mm -hmm. it will be a major uh, uh, plus plus for our energy security also which is which is good to know as also diversify our energy supplies no you see the energy i must tell you as far as gas is concerned currently 
I think the global production should be about what 480 million metric tons per annum. Mm -hmm. But you know, with the new fields coming up, this will go up to 900 uh, or so yeah. million um, uh, metric tons per annum. Mm -hmm. And I think um, we have been diversifying. Right. We used to import from 27 countries crude oil. We've now importing from 39. Mm -hmm. I mean, we never bought much energy from the U.S. We're buying 20 billion dollars mm -hmm. from Russia. Before the February 22 uh, event, our imports were 0.2 percent. Mm -hmm. We are buying, uh, I think, 1.4 uh, million barrels a day from them. Oh, it had gone up, then came down. Mm -hmm. Look, India, large population, a fast-growing economy, energy growth and consumption is three times the global average. So India will need energy. Right. And I think good policy would mean, as so far we succeeded, we have to ensure availability, we have to ensure affordability, and also sustainability. I mean, um, in the last, say, two years, energy prices in India's neighborhood have gone up by 70-80%. Uh, in the Western developed world, industrialized world, they've gone up by 30-40%. India is the only country in the world where uh, uh, crude oil, uh, petrol prices have come down by 5%. True. And diesel prices by 0.2%. Why? Because the Honorable Prime Minister mm -hmm. took bold decisions on two occasions, mm -hmm. November 2021 and May 2022, reduced the government cess, central government cess, mm -hmm. um, uh, excise duty, excise duty uh, on, on this thing. And the BJP rule states also so, brought their VAT uh, uh, thing down. Yeah. So you have this situation that one part of the world where uh, India, where you worked also, in the north, uh, West Bengal, yeah. their petrol retails 11 rupees 80 pice more expensive per liter than, say, a BJP state. Yeah. So, um, I think we've done navigated so far, but at the coming time, we have to be careful because the situation so far, I think energy prices are by and large within the band are under control, right? But uh, they could spiral out of control. So, and that's the last question that I have that we started discussion on the Israel, Hamas, and, uh, and the terror part of it. If this uh, conflict uh, prolongs or gets uh, stretched. Will this affect uh, energy prices or uh, will this affect energy supplies? Do you think happening in that? No, I, as I said, mm. I chose my words carefully. The adjectives I use it, I hope uh, maturity prevails and you have a situation in which uh, uh, people will not allow uh, the supply lines to get affected. Right. And I think also, um, uh, no, the state of Israel has got a major uh, challenge on its hand. Yes. And uh, they have to give a response to that. Exactly. Uh, but so far, I find that they're being uh, calibrated and uh, uh, reasonably cautious, etc. And it's, a, you know, the process. Went. But if it spirals out of control or there's a involvement from others, etc., uh, it could. So you have to be very careful. Uh, but so far, as I said, fingers crossed, uh, we've navigated it so far. We hope to navigate it in the remaining time also. I'm sure with your experience and with the uh, the kind of support you have in the uh, government, uh, I think that should not be a problem. But thank you very much for your time. I know you are uh, short of time right now, but we must have one more conversation. We will have. We on, will. on urban housing and urban development. Whatever you like. Whatever you like. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.